I remember Vision On because it was funny and daft. Oh, hello. Uh, today's theme is... Uh... It was the only programme of its kind that was so accessible to deaf children. It never crossed my mind it was for deaf children. I designed this sequence where I was feeding worms to a mechanical chicken, which laid eggs into a huge frying pan. I press a detonator with my foot, the yolk pops off, and I fire a gallon of custard at my face. There was quite a lot of slapstick involved. The custard, over the afternoon, set. It was a six-inch mortar in a dustbin of sand. So when I pressed the detonator, it went boom, and it shot over the set, and I could hear this woman screaming behind, and the main skin of the custard had fallen on her head, and she was absolutely hysterical. All the clues were there, but it wasn't front of mind that this was for deaf children, this was for us. This was comedy, this was art, this was animation. This little, little kind of anarchistic, glorious madness that the BBC didn't even know was going on because it was happening in Bristol, so we could get away with anything we wanted. The entire studio was covered in custard, including Tony, and you could smell it burning on the lights. Patrick said, we're going to have to take it again. The year is 1964. Muffin the Mule is back in his stable and the wooden top strings are drooping. In their place, newcomer Blue Peter is shaking things up and Play School has hit the airwaves with its long-haired presenters. It's the dawn of a golden era of children's TV. Vision On had so much music that we can all hum along with, we can't always remember exactly which bit of the programme it was from. So this is my favourite, which is the closing theme. Joe Godwin, director of BBC Children's TV, who has an iPod full of tunes from those days, including the memorable Vision On themes. And the gallery music, which I think everybody remembers because it's been used so much since, it's become a sort of icon for children's television in the 60s and 70s and it's been used in spoofs. We've used it continually since the 60s and 70s on art programmes. You know, the son of, grandson of, great-grandson of Vision On have had galleries and used the same music. They take me back to sitting on the floor watching the telly in Leamington Spa when I was seven and, and they're very, very powerful. Vision On ran on BBC One for 12 years. It was a splendiferous, humorous potpourri of sketches, art, mime, explosions and imaginative camera work. Using sign language to interpret what little speech there was and, crucially, enlisting the talents of a wide range of amateur animators. We did a little sequence featuring a dog and a kind of vacuum cleaner, I think it was. <laughs> I think the vacuum cleaner probably sucked up the dog and then the vacuum cleaner then, as it were, sucked up itself. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so that's going back a long time. David Sproxton, a founder of Ardman Animations, a company which itself is part of the Vision On legacy. Vision On also launched the TV careers of Sylvester McCoy and Wolf Lunn, and it was anchored by the double act of Tony Hart Hello, Tony. and Pat Kiesel. Hello, Pat. In 1972, it won Best Children's TV Programme in the World at the International Prix Jeunesse, and in 1973, curiously, it won the BAFTA Award for the Best Specialised Series scooping even Dr. Jacob Bronowski's seminal 13-part series, The Ascent of Man. So what was the winning formula aimed at delighting deaf children, but which won an audience of millions who just wanted to watch great television? The deputy head in those days was Ursula Eason, who was, like I am now, very hard of hearing and sympathetic towards the profoundly deaf, and decided to do a programme for them. Former director of BBC Children's, Edward Barnes, recalling the vision on precursor for deaf children. Not a very sexy title, but... That was, and that was running for some time, was, I think, Yeah, it, it was. I mean, it was narrow casting to a very large extent. It was broadcast monthly. Susan Daniels is the chief executive of the National Deaf Children's Society. But it used very slow speech and some captions, but it actually never took off. Candles like this were used before clocks were invented. She then employed Pat, Patrick Dowling, to, uh, to be the director, and he sort of took it over. He was a very clever guy anyway, and he started to sharpen it up until eventually he said to Ursula, why don't we call it Vision On, Eight, which is, used to seven, be the flashing light sign six, uh, four, when you were on the air. Four, three. And so it was Patrick Dowling and Ursula Eason who started Vision On, and the idea was it was to be a very fast programme. 
Presenter Tony Hart joined Pat Kiesel in the second year and his talents as a TV presenter were fostered on the show. Tony never considered himself to be an artist with a capital A. He had a facility, and uh, what a facility he had. I mean, he was a very modest man, Tony. He was a very easygoing, gentle man, wasn't he? Oh, he was a lovely chap. Everybody loved Tony. How did you actually get into television, though, in the first place? Here he is, talking to Sue McGregor in 1977. Went to a party, met a producer. He said, I'm looking for somebody to draw an animated fish. There was nothing to draw on, so I took a paper napkin. Don't even know if there were felt pens in those days. Whatever I used to make a mark, I drew a fish, drawing bubbles, and he said, you're in. Tony Hart was part of that family of avuncular characters that I remember from the 60s and 70s with Johnny Morris and Blue Peter presenters and later John Craven, who became this core group of people who you looked up to because they had great skills, they were very, very engaging. And I, I think... Tony Hart actually designed the Blue Peter ship, so he, he was really part of the DNA of BBC Children's. And we used to animate these little stories by putting pictures on easels all down the side of the studio. One camera would crab, you know, make its way slowly along from picture to picture, and people would lie on the floor underneath, pulling bits of string and knicker elastic and stuff to make, make the pictures work. One of those holding the knicker elastic might well have been Clive Doig, who cut his directing teeth at Vision On with Pat and Tony. And his cartoons were amazing. If one ever went to Tony's signings, he could draw maybe 500 individual drawings of animals or whatever anybody wanted with his signature. And the speed with the which speed. he did it. It's the speed and the accuracy, yeah. isn't That's it? That's right. We then went on to his... Gigantics. Now, the Gigantics I want to talk about because they just explain how technically difficult that was. The basic ones was he was with a white lining machine, maybe on tarmac on an airport or we used Bounds Green Fire Station a lot, and the camera would be above him at a certain angle and he was able to draw on the ground what was a perfect shape from the viewpoint of the camera. And so I did an experiment with him where... He drew a perfect circle, but on the ground, it was the most elongated egg shape you can imagine. Now, people tell me, and I was astonished by this when I heard when I was a child, that one of da Vinci's, you know, the sign of his genius almost, was that he could actually hand draw a perfect circle. Yes. Well, you're talking about a man here who could hand draw a, a perfect shape. From a different viewpoint. Which it's was extraordinary. Which, uh, absolutely amazing. And then when we came to do things like uh, really big gigantics, he drew a mermaid on the sands by riding a motorbike with a rake attached to the back of it and just drove it round the sands and drew a mermaid. The ultimate ephemeral art because That's it was right. about to be washed away. That's right. Well, I was the presenter who talked the most, I suppose. Pat Kiesel started very early on in uh, the programme For the Deaf, and that was speaking and miming. In order to incorporate children who were deaf and hard of hearing, I used the sign language. That wasn't very popular to begin with because it was against the educational policy to use sign language. She was a great friend of the RNID and founded the Theatre for the Deaf. Of course, the people who were deaf loved it because they could understand what I was saying. She trained with Jack Lecoq in France as a mime artist. She brought some of that tradition into the programme, which was very appealing. And her involvement, I believe, in the theatre of the deaf meant that she started to have a sense of what was accessible to deaf audiences. Pat was a very serious lady. And I think she learnt sign language because of the programme. Yes. She didn't know it before. No, she didn't. Sylvester McCoy, who later went on to become Doctor Who, was recruited as the comic foil to work with Pat Kiesel. Pat, she could let her hair down. And working with me, I always thought that it was like a really weird double act because she was older than I and she was quite straight-laced. Sylvester, look! She told me once that she was the wife of an RAF man in Malaysia. She was a bit of a rebel because she wanted to get into the art and none of the other wives would talk to her because she'd gone native, they thought. But at the same time, she was, you know, kind of quite prim and proper. She was BBC, as there was in those she days. She was a very BBC presenter. Yes. Now, so was Tony in a way, but Tony... Yeah, he was...
was, was a strange visual genius, wasn't he? Oh, he was glorious because he was so posh. I mean, he he was British Empire. You know, he was the British Raj, really. Absolutely. And they also at the same time, he was such a delightful man. You know, his eyebrows were up. He was watching things, um, and you know, he was continuously thinking up ideas. The early programmes were simple and possibly a little slow, but as awareness grew of how most deaf children, just like most other children, seem to prefer humour and a speedy delivery, Patrick Dowling shoveled more and more into the mix. Dynamic action, art and slapstick, funky one-minute animation sent in by amateurs, and grander and grander stunts. Each of its 192 episodes were held together by a common theme. Director Clive Doig. Each year, all the contributors, and those were contributors who made animation, made films, the artists and the production crew, would get together to have a brainstorming, to just go through the 16 themes we were going to do. All those contributors would then think, oh, I can do something for that, Reflect I can do that. something um, Give me that. some idea of the themes. I, do you know, I can't remember. Today's theme is uh, picnics. There were things like circles, triangles, trees. Uh, airplanes flying, sadness, uh, happiness, love. Countryside, think. Uh, storms. Ballards or ripples in a pond. Oh, uh, bridges. Today, Vision On is about time kind of abstract themes around which, you know, it was mostly about looking at the world. We did one which was called Black and White. Clive Doig had previously worked, in a more junior capacity, on such groundbreaking shows as Peter Cook and Dudley Moore's Not Only But Also, Till Death Us Do Part, and the very first TV appearance of Edna Everidge. He and producer Patrick Dowling were determined to find and champion new talent and new comic characters, such as David Cleveland's creation, The Prof. Well, The Prof was very, very popular with children, he was a man in a white coat who basically flew through the air one inch off the ground because their technique was stop frame animation. People like Penny Nuttall Smith, who was a housewife down in Guildford, who shot her films behind her sofa, only lit by an angle poise. And then we had, and I can't remember, he was a postman who did a dinosaur line drawing every week. And we had Merrick Lang head of Czechoslovakian news and had had to leave in 1968 during the Dubček problems. And then, of course, about two years before it was taken off, one of them came down to rushes, and I liked it, which was a line drawing of a superhero who they called Ardman. Yes, that's Ardman Animations, as in the multi-award winning creators of Wallace and Gromit. My father was a documentary producer and a very keen amateur photographer, so he had a 16mm Bolex. Mm -hmm. And I'd met Pete at school. We must have been, I guess, 13 or 14. Pete, that's Peter Lord, who co-founded Ardman with David Sproxton. What did you and Peter do? Do you remember the first 100 feet you shot and what was in it? And well, how you did? we did some classic pixelation. We did a bit of that. We did some chalk drawings. As a hobby in, in, in your yeah. front room? We then got through our A-levels. By this time, we'd got rid of, we found that doing the 2D work was quite tedious, uh, and we kind of were exploring doing stuff with clay and plasticine, and actually we came up with these little characters called the Glebees. They were sort of troll-like characters with very long noses and stumpy, so they wouldn't fall over, and they got up to some rather abstract activities. I phoned them up and said, that is absolutely wonderful. Can we have more of those? It must have been like the kids who go into a recording studio and they're on Radio 1 a month later. I mean, it must have been an extraordinary thrill. Oh, very threat. much so. And how did you think of the programme? I mean, did you consciously think it's a programme for deaf people or was it just a wonderful artistic vehicle for you? I think, yes, it was the latter. It was a very beautifully visual programme. Uh, you know, Pat Kiesel, Ben Benison, Wilf Lunn, all these people were on it. Uh, it was both entertaining, comic at times, intriguing... It was based on the idea that the deaf child could watch it and wouldn't miss out on anything. I was brought up by deaf parents. My father, in actual fact, could not speak. Wilf Lunn, a regular on the show and creator of the infamous custard flinging device, found inspiration in his own father's well-developed sense of humour. You see, the only thing that my father could really follow with the telly was wrestling, because it was straightforward. He knew what was going on. His specialities were explosions and elaborate Heath Robinson-like machines with no discernible purpose. What's that? Oh, this. Mm. I'm glad you asked it. Oh. 
their genius being the unfolding nature of the action. And I used to try and get tension in the build-up, like with the, the goodbye machine. You could see what, what was happening. The candle was getting nearer and nearer to the balloon. It was a nice build. It was the best machine, really, because it was a nice build-up of tension. And then the balloon would go bang and the thing would come down and say, goodbye. It's marvellous. Thank you. The miracle of the age. Come on. Wilf Makepeace Glorious Lunn used to come along with these wonderful inventions. Sylvester McCoy. Victorian-looking, gorgeous artworks that would always blow up and explode and do all sorts of stuff like that. But the first time I used it, it had worked perfectly all day, and when the candle went under the balloon, the candle went out. And the entire studio went, oh, whereupon the balloon, which had, it must have burnt a tiny hole, the balloon went... And the blind dropped down and they all cheered. There's some pretty hairy stunts in there. Did you have a man with a clipboard constantly... Oh, no, we would never have been allowed to make it if we did a man with a clipboard. Thank goodness they hadn't come up with health and safety. I used to use a lot of explosives. Of a comedy effects, stuck some cotton wool sticking out of my ear. Sylvester was stood next to me. So, you know, big, so it could be seen. And, you know, so all these explosions, I wouldn't have to listen to that horrible noise. Because you've got huge wads of, of cotton wool stuffed in his ears. And then we did all this thing and... <laughs> Wham, bang, where my head, all this was going on. And after I'd done the little scene I was doing, I said to him, Um, oh, where did you get that cotton wool? I said, when that box there, he said, that wasn't cotton wool, he said, that was gun cotton. And his ears were stuffed with nitro. I mean, if the, a spark had hit in there, you know, go zoop, right through my brain and out the other end, and that would have been the end of me. You had gun cotton in your ears yes. standing in a field of exploding... Of exploding. Wolf. You see, I'm machines. sorry, Sylvester, this is what health and safety officers are for. I know, but, well, you know, it was worth it. He's just probably blown his eardrums out. It was a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvester McCoy and Wolf Lunn had both been part of the anarchic Ken Campbell's Roadshow, where the pair were talent spotted. He, yeah, he just wanted to break every rule there was and get a laugh while doing it. With Ken, was it... Pretty much a free-for-all at the rehearsal period, at least. Everybody bring their ideas in. Yes, there was quite a lot of that, yeah. And then, eventually, Ken would decide what was going on and have you up against the wall going, No, I'm the director, you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, you know, but... Uh, he was the, the boss. He was... He was the boss. <laughs> he was such a boss, he would sit in the audience and, and say, you know, you're doing... You're doing Act better! <laughs> and, and then, oh, act louder! Oh, God. God, <laughs> While you were performing? Yes, yes. No, no, he didn't. <laughs> Clive loved Ken Campbell as well. When he got me, he wanted that to, me to bring that baggage of Campbell-esque stuff with me. They knew I couldn't act. So they do things like, they rehearse all day, me coming through a door in my Bermuda shorts with my sunglasses on. Then when they actually did the take... I'd walk through the door and some guys would throw two buckets of ice-cold water over it to see what the reaction was. Sylvester, both watching it before you joined and then when you were in it, did it feel groundbreaking? Did it feel that you yes. were really experimenting? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, mean, I can remember quite clear we did uh, colour overlay and it was blue at the time, it was just coming in. And we got hold of it and we started to doing multiple shots, you know, experimenting. And we also had things like they the put a mirror in the ceiling and shoot up the mirror down on top of us. And it really did feel that we were, we were at the beginning of something brand new. And in a way, I think it suddenly became anarchic anyway and, 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 and very surreal. It was sort of very part of that 60s, we can try anything type yeah. vibe, wasn't yeah, it? it was. And we did. I think the other sort of historical angle on it was that a lot of changes went on in the BBC Children's Department in the 50s and 60s. Joe Godwin, Director, Children's BBC. And actually in 1964, the Children's Department, which had only been created in 1951, was closed down or it was merged with the Women's Programmes Department to make a new department called Family Programmes. And, and I wonder whether there was a sense that children's programmes were less important to the BBC for that period, which gave licence to the people working there to sort of get on with what they wanted to do, because nobody was that bothered. This was the mid-1960s, when ITV was for the first time giving the BBC a genuine run for its money which concentrated BBC executive minds on primetime programmes. And I wonder whether that was a spur to some amazing creativity, because nobody was really taking a lot of notice. So, does Edward Barnes agree? The marvellous thing about children's programme is, is that unless you do something which 
causes questions in the house <laughs> or somebody is caught with his trousers down in the gents or something, you're more or less left alone as long as you're reasonably successful in delivering an audience to build on for the evening programmes, which is marvellous. But the thing about Bijnam was that it was supposed to stimulate children into doing things themselves, try and emulate what was being done on the screen, playing with rice and seeds to make a picture or to make a machine like Will Flum did or going backwards. It was very hard to do. I worked for, oh, days and weeks trying to perfect a walking backwards that would look natural when the film was reversed and run forwards. But it was never quite right. There was always a sort of little lift in the wrong place. But everyone got really involved in this, because if you had to film a close-up, say, and you had, you'd have to, say, like, hit your hand on the table <laughs> and go, ow, and you'd have to work that out and go, ow. Walking backwards, drawing gigantic mermaids on the beach, creating sculptures out of heaps of matchboxes, of which no doubt plenty were available in the 1960s and 70s home, art was at the heart of the programme. And at the heart of the art, no, we haven't forgotten, was its most treasured slot. And now, here is the gallery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now here's the gallery, and please send in your paintings and those that will be shown, you can see, but some won't, but we can't send them back. I remember that. I never sent anything into the gallery, but I obsessively watched it and made critical remarks. I suppose about five to 10,000 paintings would come in a week. A week? A week. They arrived in the post room at Western Avenue and... We couldn't cope. Of course we couldn't cope. And so the BBC hired grandparents to sort out all these paintings and drawings for the programme. And what happened was the very first day they came in and they started. Picks up an envelope. Oh, oh Bert, Bert, come over here. Come and have a look at this. And Bert would come over you say, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Isn't that nice? But by the end of the day, they were ripping open and saying, nope, and chucking it on the side. Nope, no, maybe. <laughs> and so it went on. My son sent in one, but uh, they didn't get taken up. And I didn't feel uh, sh I should go and, you know, say, this is my son, stick it on. So out of 5,000, 15, 15 would be shown. And those kids must have been very proud of it. It was a big thing. It was almost Blue Peter Badge sort of thing to get your, your painting up there. Thank you for all your pictures. The phrase everybody remembers is... And there's a prize for all those we show. So what happened to the rejects? Unfortunately, as soon as we'd had the gallery, Pat Kiesel would say, I'm sorry that we can't return them to you. And all those paintings would be binned. They were literally destroyed. They were destroyed, yes. Clearly, the gallery, more than anything, was the item that connected the programme to its viewers, just as much for the hearing as for the non-hearing audience. And also what was wonderful about it was that it appealed not only to deaf children, but to hearing children as well. Susan Daniels, Chief Executive of the National Deaf Children's Society. That it was something that engaged the whole family and hearing siblings and hearing friends. Setting out in 1964 with a specific remit to create a programme for deaf children, Vision On quickly appealed to the broadest audience without losing its original focus. That's a remarkable juggling act to pull off. We did many, many co-productions with different countries, especially France and Switzerland. In America, where it's sold to 98 syndicate stations, De Clique in French and in French Canada, Oyerblick in Sweden, and to Germany as well. This show sold al almost it, around it, the world. It's sold practically to every country in the world. Which made its sudden demise in 1976 even more surprising. Edward Barnes was the man in charge at the time. I didn't take it off. Patrick came to me and said, I think we've gone as far as we can with this now. I think that was another way of saying, I want to do another programme. At the time, I was very disappointed because I, I felt that we could have gone on and developed it. I think Pat Kiesel was leaving anyway. But I'd done it for 12 years, you see, so it was probably time that um, I did something else. And in fact, the elements of Vision On then split into two. He went on with Tony Hart to do Take Heart, and I went on and did a programme called Jigsaw. Vision On's art may have been ephemeral, but its legacy certainly is not. Take Heart was just one of several subsequent vehicles for Tony Hart, 
Pat Kiesel continued her work with the Theatre for the Deaf. Then there were shows like Eureka, See Here, Tis Was, and the success of Ardman Animations, the career of Sylvester McCoy, one time Doctor Who, and now starring in Peter Jackson's new film, The Hobbit, they all owe a debt to this daring, innovative children's programme. But would Vision On, or an equivalent, be commissioned today? I think in terms of accessibility, Vision On was a fantastic starting point. Joe Godwin, BBC Director of Children's. The change now from the 1960s is we wouldn't necessarily do that in a dedicated programme for deaf children. In the same way that society has changed and integration in education has taken place, it's the same with our programming, that across what we do, we try to make everything we do as accessible as possible. Nearly 100% of our programmes are subtitled now, which is one big reason that we don't have to have a dedicated programme for deaf children. I think there is still more work to be done. And obviously the BBC can be proud of the fact that they have a 100% subtitling. But the main feedback we get from children and young people, they want to see deaf characters portrayed positively on television. They want to see the characters themselves using signing in a positive way and they want it to be fully accessible. We live in a time where there are 35 dedicated children's TV channels to say nothing of computer games, DVDs, smartphones and all the rest. It's unlikely that any children's programme could now possibly have the effect that a Blue Peter or a Vision On had in their day. Indeed, just this year, the BBC have decided to move all their specialised children's programmes off the mainstream channels. But the lasting impact that this show had, not just creatively, but actually on its audience, shouldn't be underestimated, as Pat and Tony, speaking in 1997, can attest. One still meets so many people who remember the programme. People who were children then are parents themselves now, but they, they still remember it and tell their children about it. And only yesterday I met a, an artist and designer who said to me that it was Vision On who switched him on to his career. And uh, he remembers it with a lot of gratitude. It would be a very strange thing if a day didn't pass when someone would stop you and say, hello, and say, I've been watching you ever since I was a little girl. And then, quite a long time ago, to be truthful, an elderly lady would say, I am a grandmother, and I watched you when I was a little girl, and you think, is it about time I pack this in? And if that music creates an insatiable desire in you to get out the rice and seeds and make a collage, just remember, you can send it in, but your picture will not be returned. Britain in a Box was presented by Paul Jackson and produced by Sarah Jane Hall.